والصلاة والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى خصوصا على أفضلهم وقادم النبيين محمد الأمين محمد الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وبعد Brother Chairman, brothers and sisters in Surah wal Akhal, we praise and thank Allah for the opportunity to be with you here tonight. And we pray that our session here tonight may be blessed by Him and that it may be of benefit to all, inshallah. Dajjal's deadliest weapon. Who is Dajjal? And why does he have weapons? Who gave him the weapons? And what is he using the weapons for? This subject belongs to a branch of knowledge known as Akhirul Zaman, Ilm Akhirul Zaman. But in the English language, it's called Islamic eschatology. It is by far the most important branch of knowledge in your Islamic university. By far, by far the most important branch of knowledge now to be taught in any institution of Islamic learning is Islamic eschatology. The Islamic view of Akhirul Zaman of the last age. We have a wealth of information in the Quran and in the ahadith of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu what is required what is required is that we must be able to interpret that information and to apply it in the world in which we live today The companions of the Prophet alayhi salatu waslam were sitting talking amongst themselves when he the Prophet alayhi salatu waslam came and asked what are you talking about? And they said we are talking about Adamat al-Sa'ah, the signs of the last day. And then he said in the hadith is in Sahih Bukhari, it is in Sahih Muslim, the last day would not come until he mentioned ten signs. And these are known as the ten major signs of the last day. In addition to these ten, there are many others. Women would be dressed and yet be naked. Women would dress like men. So the night wants to become day. Men would dress like women. So your baby boys are going to grow up behaving like girls. Go ahead eating all those hormones and so on. See what's going to happen. There are many, many other signs than these ten. The ten are, and by now you should have memorized them, but I don't have the time to test you. <laughs> Number one, and these signs have not been given in the order in which they will occur. So we're giving them to you randomly. Number one, the Dajjal. Al-Masih al-Dajjal. Number two, Gag and Magar, Ya'juj and Ma'juj. And incidentally, there's scarcely any proper literature on the subject written in the modern age. 
it is not uncharitable on my part to say. Because I have attended five universities and I am now knocking on the door of 70 years of age. So there are some liberties I can take. It is not uncharitable for me to say that most of the literature that you find written in the modern age on these subjects is worthy of being sent on a one-way ticket to Disneyland. You know where Disneyland? <laughs> Meaning it's not scholarly. It's not scholarly. So number one, Dajjal. Number two, Gog and Magog. Number three, the return of the son of Mary. Perhaps if you turn off this fan, you might get less um, static here. Number three, the return of the son of Mary. Number four, Dukhar, smoke, which I am of the opinion should be visible, I think, 20, 25 years from now. But of course, I can be mistaken. But when you see that smoke up there, you know most of mankind will not survive. There will be a few people left on the earth. Number five, the battle up. The battle up, a creature, a beast of the earth, or the land. Number six, that the sun will rise from the west. Number seven, eight, and nine, three, khusuf, plural of khas, a shaking of the earth, movement of the earth, accompanied by a sinking. So an earthquake with sinking. One in the east, one in the west, and the third one in Dr. Mansuri, UK. <laughs> the third one in Arabia. And number 10, you know that the house sank down in Dr. Mansuri, UK? It was Ramadan. You know what? The whole house was down. And number 10, that this, the, the fire will come out of Yemen and drive people to their place of assembly. These are the 10 major signs of the last day. Among these, one of the most important is the Dajjal. Dajjal is a creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who will one day appear in the form of a human being. I'm choosing my words very carefully. Eh? He has to appear in the form of a human being because he has been created and given a mission to impersonate the true Messiah. And since the true Messiah is a human being, the only way that the Jal can impersonate the Messiah is if he appears as a human being. The true Messiah is the son of Mary, Nabi Isa alayhi salam. And Allah made a promise to Banu Israel that when that Messiah comes, he would rule over from the throne of Nabi Dawood alayhi so the golden age of Nabi Sulaiman alayhi salam when the state of Israel ruled over. When the state of Israel was the ruling state of the world. What's the definition of a ruling state? You must be fully familiar with that by now. A ruling state is one whose rule cannot be rivaled or challenged. That's a ruling state. You don't have to rule every single square inch of PLCC. <laughs> no. Once you have a rule in the world which cannot be challenged, cannot be rival. This was the kind of, pro of state that Suleiman alayhi salam ruled over. The holy state of Israel. And that was the golden age. Zaman Mas. Zaman Mas. 
And when the Messiah comes, that golden age will come back one more time. But when Allah sent the Messiah, they rejected him. Some of them believed him. Why did they reject him? Because they said, He's a bastard. Because his mother was not married when she gave birth to him. And a bastard cannot be the Messiah. <coughs> and then he could not have been the Messiah because he's dead. Before our very eyes we saw him die on the cross, crucified. He never ruled over. So now it is beyond the shadow of a doubt. He could not be the Messiah. What they did not know, and what no one knew, not even the government of Malaysia, no one knew, was that no, he did not die. No, he was not crucified. But Allah made it appear like that. What happened? I hope we can discuss that in a lecture to be scheduled on an Islamic view of the return of Jesus alayhi salam. I hope we can do that inshallah. So we can take up that subject in detail. But Allah raised him. So he never experienced something called mouth. mouth. And so one day he'll come back to dark because Every soul must be stuck. But they didn't know that. So they're waiting for the Messiah to come. I lived for 10 years in New York. You can't be in New York and not know that. That the Jews are waiting for the Messiah to come. So Allah created this being. And Allah programmed this being to impersonate the Messiah and gave to him Dajjal, gave to him powers of deception. He can deceive you in anything connected with him. Appearance and reality are opposite from each other. His mission is to rule the world. And when he rules the world with a rule which cannot be rival, which cannot be challenged, then he will declare, I am the Messiah. And then he can rub his hands and say, mission accomplished. But that's a tall order to rule the whole world. How are you going to do that? You must come with a very, very, very good strategy if you are to rule the world. The Muslims are not going to accept you. No? Maybe the part-time Muslims, but not the real Muslims. So how are you going to get them to accept you as the Messiah? Not all the Jews are going to accept you because there are Jews who are Orthodox Jews. So in order to rule the world, you're going to have to impose a political dictatorship upon all of mankind. Well, I have news for you. That political dictatorship is almost here. You have to have a world government ruling over the whole world. So forget about state sovereignty. When Dajjal says stand up, the government has to stand. And Dajjal says sit down, the government has to sit. You don't have freedom anymore. In 1991, the Security Council of the United Nations had to vote on a resolution 
committing the use of force against Iraq. 91. Cuba was a member of the Security Council. Yemen was a member. China, of course, was a permanent member. Malaysia was a member. And when the resolution came for a vote, Malaysia voted in favor. Although every single Muslim in Malaysia opposed it. Every single one opposed it. Nobody supported it. But the government of Malaysia voted in favor. Yemen voted against or abstained. Cuba voted against. China voted against. But the Muslim state voted in favor. Your Prime Minister at that time was Dr. Mahathir. And he explained. He said, if we had not done that, they would have destroyed our economy. That was his explanation. So state sovereignty? That was something for the birds. It no longer exists. You now have world government. And that world government is taking, to, taking you towards a universal political dictatorship. In order for him to rule the world, you must have, you must impose a, a universal economic dictatorship upon man. We are already there. We are already there. But the child is almost at the conclusion of his mission. It will not be long again before the state of Israel. You know, 15 years ago they used to laugh at me and scoff at me when I said to them that they want Israel to rule the world. Imran, what nonsense are you talking? How can few million people, few million Jews in Israel rule the whole world? Huh? Shame on you. They're not laughing anymore now. No. They're swallowing all the laughter they have. Israel has to rule the world. And when Israel rules the world, then the Jal can appear as the ruler of Israel, ruling the world from Jerusalem and declare, I am the Messiah. We are not going to discuss his political weapon tonight. That is the shirk, which is at the very heart of the political state, the new secular state system of the world. Except to say that there is a hadith in the Musnad of Imam Ahmad, in which the Prophet was on war about his shirk, with which he attacked this Ummah. The Prophet said that the, the shirk of this Ummah would be more difficult to recognize than a black ant on a black stone, fizulumatil laid in the darkness of the night. And so if most of mankind, particularly those who are professors of political science at the universities, if most of mankind cannot recognize the shift in the political system, don't blame them. But that's no excuse for them. The one sin that Allah will not forgive is shirk. And he says so in the Quran. But you know the traffic jam in PL, people don't have time for the Quran. <laughs> Too much traffic jam. Where, is it? Where are you going to get the time to study the Quran? So, we live and we die without knowing what Allah says in the Quran about shirk. But this is not our topic tonight, about the shirk of the political system. Our topic tonight is about his deadliest weapon. The Prophet said that the last people to come out in the jail will be women. That's a formidable weapon. Oh yes. If he can corrupt the woman, that's it. All fall down. 
But that's not our topic tonight, the feminist revolution. That's not his deadliest weapon. His deadliest weapon is that with which he enslaves you. And when you enslave, you no longer have your independence, you no longer have your freedom, you no longer have your power to resist it. How does he enslave you? It is with riba. Do not, do not attempt to study the subject of riba as a mere economic problem. Do not confine your study of the subject of riba to one which will be studied with the tools of economic analysis. No, you're not going to get to You've got to locate this subject in a bigger framework. And that is Islamic eschatology, which is what we started with. What is riba? I don't need more than three, four minutes to answer that question. That's all I need. Three or four minutes and I can tell you what is riba. I don't need a whole volume like this. Riba is borrowing and lending money on what today is called interest. That's finished, that's it. Allah has prohibited money lending on interest. In any transaction involving an exchange of money, which is of course, you go to the bank and you know what is an exchange of money. Once it is the same money which is being used, the Prophet said it must be equal for equal. You cannot have an unequal exchange of money. That the bank gives me or lends me 1,000 ringgits and I am obliged to return to the bank 2,000 ringgits, which is a loan and interest, you understand? The Prophet Islam has prohibited money lending on interest. He has cursed all folk. And if you die with the curse of the Prophet upon you, I can tell you what can happen to you in the grave. If you have not had dinner as yet, I suggest skip dinner tonight because the dinner won't digest. He cursed the one who gives the river. He cursed the one who takes the river. He cursed the one who records the transaction. And he cursed the two witnesses and he said they are all equally guilty. And if you die with that sin of river, what can be the punishment in the grave? No, let me spoil you the number. In Surah Al Zumar, Allah says, Allah will be a fellow for Sahina Moutiha, who let the lamb double for Manamina. For you, she could let the Kaba Ali and Mout, or you see the Ukra Ila Ejal in Mosama. Allah takes the souls when it is the time of Mout. Mout, which is death. Mount is dead. And those who do not die while you are awake, Allah takes your souls while you are asleep. He then keeps those souls for which for whom mouth is written. And the rest he sends them back for a prescribed period of time. But during the time that the soul is out of the body, you are not dead. No! No matter how long he keeps the soul out of the body, that body will not decompose. No! 
They're not dead. But there is no, no medical evidence that you're alive. Hmm? So, the fellow who was the money lender put his money in fixed deposit and looking to see where he could get the best returns and so on, and he dies. So he dies with the curse of Muhammad alayhi salatu salam on him. What can be the punishment for him in the grave? Allah takes his soul. So everybody thinks he's dead. No sign of life. So they give the body the ghusl and they close the body and then they perform the salatul janazah. Not knowing the man is not there. That is punishment. That is punishment. And then they take the body to the cemetery and they bury him. <coughs> not knowing that he is not dead. There is no way at all that you can tell that that man is not dead. Now, this is the power of Allah. And after the last person has gone some distance from the grave, then the soul is returned to the body. So this fellow opens his eyes. Of course, the receipt for the fixed deposit, he's searching for it, it's not there in his pocket. The place is dark. What happened? Calls out to his wife, no answer. Where did she go? He tries to get up. Can't get up. Where am I? He begins to panic now. He doesn't know. He's confused. Because he has utter darkness. And then he realizes, what is this strange smell? The camphor that you put, you know, the dead body when you wash it. And what kind of clothes do I have? I'm happy. I didn't go to sleep with this clothes. And he begins to feel and feel and feel and feel. And of course, he didn't put a cell phone for him. <laughs> but carrying him. And then slowly, 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 he realizes that he's in his own grave. Now, you will know what is Allah's punishment. You forget all the traffic jams in here now. So the Prophet Islam cursed all four. Why did he curse them? Why has Allah prohibited borrowing and lending money on interest? Hmm? The answer is so simple, you don't need more than a few minutes to answer that. Because Allah Himself answers the question. First of all, He introduces His answer with a contrast. The contrast is between riba and charity. min riban وَمَا آتَيْتُمْ مِنْ زَكَاةٍ تُرِيدُونَ وَجْهَ اللَّهَ فَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُدْعِفُونَ سُرَةُ الرُّومِ That which you put out to invest in riba, the money lender, seeking an increase in your capital. It won't increase with Allah. Oh, there's something wrong with this business. What is it? But that which you put out in charity, giving in charity, to help those who are in need, and you do it not so you could get something, you know. France will give you the loan, but you've got to buy the tractors from France. No, that's aid as a form of imperialism. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> you give in charity for Allah. Seeking nothing. That will multiply many times with Allah. So there is a contrast between riba and charity. 
What is the lesson? Answer, in charity you give and you take nothing in return. Shame on you! If you're giving and you're thinking something in return, that, that's not charity. So in charity you give but you take nothing in return. So Allah is teaching you that riba is the opposite of that. In riba you're only taking. Taking from Africa. Taking from Africa. Taking from Africa. And giving nothing in return. So at the end of the day, Africa has nothing. And you have everything. <laughs> huh? In this transaction, his loss is your gain. That's not business. So now Allah takes us to the second contrast by which he teaches the subject. It's so simple. They say that riba is like business. Allah says, no! Allah has made business halal and made riba haram. So now, What's the difference between business and riba? In a business transaction, you've got to take a risk. Oh yeah. And in taking that risk, you've got to use your business acumen. Hmm? You're not going to invest your money in a business and the businessman drives his um, runs his business the way some people drive in KL. <laughs> you want to invest your money in a business run by someone who has business experience, who has business acumen. <laughs> and so, in a business transaction, you got to plant in order to reap. But sometimes the farmer plants and the crop doesn't come out. Sometimes he plants and he gets an abundance of crops. So you're taking a chance. That's business. Risk. You can have a profit, you can have a loss. Riba is not like that. Riba is not business. Because in riba, you don't have to plan. All the donkeys will plant and you will reap what they plant. That's not business. The money lender does not want to embrace risk. No. He must get his pound of flesh. Regardless of you. <laughs> Whether you suffer loss or make a profit is irrelevant to him. He has to get his pound of flesh. So he is engaged in risk-free investment. He is, to use medical terminology, he is immunized from loss. Allah says that's not business. When you do business, then Allah can take from some and give to others. And so wealth will circulate through the economy. One day for you, one day for me. When governments attempt to distribute wealth and to redistribute wealth, they make a mess of it. They corrupt the market, but they're too foolish to even understand that. And they corrupt the very people they're trying to help, but they're too foolish to even understand that. Islam insists on a free and fair market. And no one has an advantage over anyone else in the market. The Malay doesn't have any advantage over the Chinese, not in an Islamic market. And the Chinese do not have an advantage over the Indian. No. The market treats everybody the same. 
whether you believe in Allah or you worship a stone, a free and a fair market. In a free and a fair market, Allah can take from some and give to others. And so there will be constant distribution and redistribution of wealth. But when an economy is based on riba, because it is not business, the rich will now remain, can you finish the sentence? Permanently rich. Forever and ever. And keep on growing richer. And the poor will be imprisoned in permanent poverty. Forever and ever. And keep on growing poor. So you reach where Indonesia is. You of course are in the comfort zone. But you reach where Indonesia is. And Bangladesh is. And that is oppression. I don't need to continue the lecture now. Lecture is finished. <laughs> when the rich are permanently rich and the poor are permanently poor, that is oppression. The Jal uses this in order to reduce mankind to poverty. Which one the mankind? The one who resists him. And those who support him by like that little island south of Malaysia, little Israel was it called? <laughs> yeah. The supports the Jal. Oh, you'll ride on the gravy train. You'll ride on the gravy train. Whoever supports Israel will have lots of bread. And whoever, oh, sorry, whoever supports the Jal and whoever opposes the Jal will have no bread. <laughs> Nabi Muhammad and Islam said that 1400 years ago. And it's here today. It's here today. So if you live in an economy in which there's plenty of bread, you better be worried. You better be worried. What happens now is that as people sink into poverty and destitution because of riba, it becomes easier for the rich to rule over the poor. And the rich rule over the poor on behalf of the judge. And the rich nations of the world rule over the poor nations of the world on behalf of the judge. As you sink more and more into poverty and destitution, you lose your freedom. You lose your independence. You lose your power. It's like the bite of a snake and the poison enters and slowly the poison paralyzes you. This is riba. How do we get out of it? Prophet Muhammad said the time will come when you will not be able to find a single person in all of mankind who will not be consuming riba. And whosoever says he is not consuming riba, verily the dust of riba will be upon him. Verily the vapor of riba will be upon him. It is here today. I have only touched at one form of riba so far, borrowing and lending on interest. And if we had the time, how much more time for, for Adhan? Seven minutes. Seven minutes. Seven minutes. Well, let's use these seven minutes to show you how do you deal with riba. And then after the Isha, so that, I mean Isha Adhan, we can then take the second part. The Quran gives us a methodology in three parts for dealing with riba, extricating yourself from riba. The first part of that methodology in the Quran is public education, which we've just done for you. Public education. Teach the people, explain the people. You cannot go to part two until you have control over territory in our country. Nowhere on the face of the earth today do you have control over territory in Allah's name. Nowhere. Nowhere on the face of the earth today. 
do you have control over territory in Allah's name? Why? Because every single square inch of the earth today is organized as secular states, which are members of the United Nations Organization, which has a charter. And the charter creates the Security Council. And the Security Council is vested with authority, supreme authority in the world. Supreme authority in all matters pertaining to international peace and security. And so if the Security Council says stand up, you've got to stand up. And if the Security Council says sit down, you've got to sit down. So you can't say that you are... <laughs> You recognize a lot of suffering. Come on, man, that's a joke. Hmm? But when you have control over territory in Allah's name, then you can enforce Allah's law. So you'll move to stage two at that time, and in stage two you will prohibit all transactions of money lending on interest. Illegal. So if a money lender lends money and the borrower refuses to pay the interest, the money lender cannot take him to court. No. There is no way you can cut the money, the interest. But in stage two, you will only you will only make illegal future transactions. All previous transactions will still remain valid. Huh? In other words, I'm going to use a long word now. There is no retroactive enforcement of the legislation. This is what happened in Marina. Why, why do you in stage two adopt this strategy? Answer, you want to turn public opinion in your favor. You want to demonize the money lender. You want to marginalize it. Why do you think banks like to give computers <laughs> to orphanages? <laughs> banks are giving computers to orphanages because banks want to get public opinion on their side. So in this stage, stage two, you're now going to Permit the money lender to continue to collect his interest. He can even go to the court. But no new money lending on interest is permitted. And so now, when the money lender goes to seek his interest on the, on the loan, he has some shame now. And society is going to be asking questions. How come Allah has prohibited it? And you still collecting your interest? You see, so the money lender is put on the defensive. That is the strategy. Until you reach stage three. And in stage three, Nabi Muhammad Islam, did not move to stage three until Khutbatul Wida. Khutbatul Wida. The farewell pilgrimage. And only after Khutbatul Wida did Allah send down revelation supporting stage 3. In stage 3 you now have retroactive enforcement. Meaning whether it be new loans or old loans, they're all prohibited. And if you do not give it up, we're going to take up the sword against you. We wage war on you. And then Nabi Muhammad made the announcement that the first one is the money owed to my uncle. What was his name? We still have a few minutes left, you know. <laughs> Abbas. Hmm? And so now the state is obliged to wage war against the money lender. And then came revelation. Ya ayyuhalladhina amanu taqallaha wa daru ma baqiya min riba in kuntum. If you do not give up riba at this third stage, we're going to wage war. The armed forces are going to take action against you in order to get eradication of riba. 
So these are the three stages given in the Quran. You cannot employ these three stages until you take control over territory in Allah's name. Allah is sovereign over that territory, not the United Nations. Not the Security Council, but Allah. The trader in Mecca who lent money on interest did so in order to increase his wealth. But the child doesn't lend money on interest merely to increase his wealth. No. He has another even more sinister objective. I come from the Caribbean island of Trinidad, otherwise known as Brian Lara country. For those who say cricket. <laughs> and next door to me is Venezuela, you know Hugo Chavez. Next door to me is Colombia. Next door to me is Brazil. Hmm? and Argentina, South America, and Central America, Nicaragua, Costa Rica. And in Central and South America, there were large numbers of Indian, Indian tribes, American Indian tribes. They never knew they, they were Indians. Right? They knew they, they were Cherokee and they were this named of tribe Arawak and Karim and so on. Suddenly they learned that they were Indians. <laughs> and then came Europe. Europe. Which came to colonize them. Brutally. With a brutality unprecedented in human history. There was no slavery in history to match the slavery of modern Europe. Huh? But sometimes it became unpalatable to enslave a people to normal slavery. So the European had to find a way to enslave them and yet not call them slaves. <laughs> so what the European plantation owners, plantation owners did was to lend money to the American Indians, but lend them knowing that they cannot repay. And when they could not repay, then you force them to walk on the plantations to repay. And when they die, then their children have to continue to work in the plantation. This was called the the Spanish word, the latifundia economy. So that the money lender sometimes lends you money, not merely to increase his wealth. He lends you an interest in order to enslave you. Have they been doing that in the world at large? Have you ever heard of a man named John Perkins? Have you ever heard of that remarkable book that you wrote? You're not supposed to write it, you know. You could end up at Guantanamo. The most shining example of Western democracy is Guantanamo. <laughs> Confessions of an Economic Hitman is a remarkable book. Because you get it out of the horse's mouth, but we are saying from the masjid's <laughs> mouth that they went to Indonesia, they went to Panama, they went to Colombia, they went to all of these countries to lend on interest in order to be able to enslave the people. And that's where we are today. How did this happen? After all, the Prophet said about the ulama, he said, al ulama warathatul anbiya That the status of the ulama, who I mean, and we're talking about the real, not the part-time, the real ulama. <laughs> These are a people who inherit the mission of the Prophets, that's their status. 
So where were the ulama when this was happening? I mean, you, a lot of time you spent drinking kekari, isn't it? Where were they? You've got to make a trip to Egypt now. I notice we have an Egyptian here tonight. Sheikh al -Azhar. His name is Sheikh Muhammad Abdu. Very famous Sheikh. And he went on a trip to Europe at the end of the 19th century. Which Europe? The Europe which emerged after the French Revolution. The French Revolution which had broken the back of the Christian Church, the Roman Catholic Church. Christian Europe had, had struggled against Riva. Indeed, the best book on Riva ever written was written by a an English sheikh. What was his name? Never heard of that famous English sheikh? Who wrote a river? William? Shakespeare, of course. William Shakespeare. What is the name of the book? The Merchant of Venice. It's the best book on river I've ever written. I've ever read. Famous British sheikh. Shakespeare. Or you can read a more scholarly work. Shakespeare is nicer to read, but you could read William R. W. Tony, T A W N O I. And the name of the book is Religion and the Rise of Capitalism. I know when you get some time from the traffic of KL to read, eh? Yeah, yeah, it's a nice book to read. Religion and the rise of capitalism, which tells you the story of how a Europe which was opposed to riba, to usury, was turned upside down to a new Europe which permitted usury for lending on interest. And uh, that which broke the back of the Christian church concerning riba was the French Revolution. And Muhammad Abdu went to Europe after that back of the Christian church had been broken and the river-based economy had emerged full blown in Europe. And secondly, Europe had a political system which was like the Khilafah. Yes. Khilafah recognized Allah's sovereignty <coughs> and Europe recognized Allah's sovereignty. Allah is sovereign and he appointed the church to be his representative, his Khalifa. So the Pope represents him. It's called the divine right of kings. So Europe had his Khilafah. And this was broken by the French Revolution. And a new conception of state emerges. It's a secular state. This declares the sovereignty is no longer up there. It's not down here. Wake up. We are now sovereign, the people. And this is the Europe that Muhammad Abdu went to visit. And when he saw that Europe, Muhammad Abdu, you're not going to believe this one. He returned to Egypt to tell the Egyptian people, I went to Europe and I found, <laughs> I found Islam. <laughs> no Muslims. I went to Europe and I found Islam, but no Muslims. If ever there was a sheikh with eyes with which he could not see, who is Muhammad Abdu? It is such a pity. So when he came back to Egypt, he said, I went to Europe and I found Islam, but no Muslims. And I've come back to Egypt to find Muslims, but no Islam. <laughs> yes. And the Egyptian people failed to crucify him. <laughs> he compounded his error. Compounded his error. When the British in, in Egypt created a marvelous institution called the Egyptian Post Office. 
and you know how efficient the British are. So you're going to now have a, a mish, a, an efficient system of mail delivery all over Egypt. But the British said that this must be a public company. The funds to establish the post office and run the post office must come from the people. And the people should recognize the value of this institution. So why don't you invest in the institution? But you and I know that if you invest, it must be on the basis of if the company makes a profit, you share in the profit. But if the company suffers a loss, you share in the loss. That business. But no, this one was like a fixed deposit. Because when you invest in the post office, you're going to get a guaranteed fixed return on your investment. A guaranteed fixed return on your investment. Come rain or come sunshine, you're getting it. With a fixed deposit. There is no risk here. It's a risk free investment. But Sheikh Allah Zagi Fatwa. Halal. Sheikh Allah Zagi Fatwa. Halal. And so Al Azhar University to this day still declares that bank interest is not riba. Why? Because look at the good things that the banks are doing. Putting up all those skyscrapers, aren't you proud of them? <coughs> Every shopping mall you have out there, huh? it's the banks. Insurance companies, they do. You should be proud of that. Huh? And so to this day, we have this abominable situation that we have fatwa from such eminent, eminent institutions that bank interest is not real. The question that we ask is, where were the ulama? I mean, that's a long time to be drinking tea, Tariq. Where were the ulama? I'm answering that question. Thankfully that you have other ulama who say, no, that's wrong. Muhammad Abdul, no, Muhammad Abdul, bank interest is river. And then you have the other one now, where that is Muhammad alayhi salatu was sometimes go to the shop and buy goods and would not have the money to pay. So the shopkeeper will give him some time to pay. There's an elegant term to describe this transaction. It's called a credit transaction. I thought credit is what you got when you hit the exam, huh? <laughs> but now it's, it's called credit. They are jacking terminology and uh, credit. <coughs> Meaning you have time to pay. Okay? So a credit transaction is halal for Muslim in Islam. But uh, did the shopkeeper raise his price because he had to wait for his money? Yeah. There is no evidence of that. And it's a little bit late to manufacture evidence now. Would work. No. If he had done that, if he had raised his price because he had to wait, W-A-I-T, wait, wait for his money, then money could increase over time. <coughs> Meaning, you don't have to plant. No, you just got to wait and the money will increase by itself. Aristotle, 3,000 years ago, blasted that. Aristotle, not a Muslim, he said, but money is not like a woman. A woman by herself could multiply. 
She is one today, she can be two tomorrow because she gave birth to baby. Money is not like that, says Aristotle. Money cannot increase by itself. And Aristotle was so correct. And so in Islam, cash price and credit price must be the same. I don't need to continue the lecture. Finish. Enough. Finish. Enough. Cash price and credit price must be the same. If you are so foolhardy as to come at me with boxing gloves and say, yes, 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 money must have value. If I have to wait for my money, I'm supposed to be compensated for it. And so credit price can be higher than cash price. And give me fatwa from this one and fatwa from that one and fatwa from that one and fatwa from that one. I will show patience for as long as I can show patience. But when patience runs out, I will say to him, come, come. Leave all your muftis behind, you come. And let both of us pray to Allah to punish with the worst possible punishment and with a punishment which will last until the end of time whosoever is wrong on this issue hmm? you don't need to bring any fatwa with you if you are brave enough and if you are convinced that you are right the credit price can be higher than cash price then come my man and let us do it I hope I never have to do that with anybody. I hope I never have to do that with anybody. No. If they want to have their opinion, let them have their opinion. One day they'll be in the place. And when they wake up and the place is so dark, you know what happened after that. No need for boxing gloves. No. If Imran Hussein is wrong, well, let him go his way. And you believe you are right, but you go your way. If even if 999 want to follow that opinion, let them follow it. We are only one on this side. No need for any boxing gloves. No need for any debates on this subject. Just allow us the freedom to choose our own choice of another. Today we have a situation in which Islamic banks around the world, including unfortunately Islamic Bank here in Malaysia, are engaged in a transaction which is the heart of Islamic banking. I call all the rest the periphery, this is the heart. A transaction that they call Morabaha. And they describe Morabaha in this way that both buyer and seller are aware of the profit market. Profit margin, they call it maka. And both buyer and seller are in agreement on it. And once that is there, it's a halal transaction. I say yes. Of course it's a halal transaction. Provided it's a cash transaction. Imran Hussein, that's the law. Go. So, <coughs> he's spoiling the fun now. <laughs> Provided it's a cash transaction and buyer and seller are both aware of the profit margin, both agree, it's a halal transaction, nobody, agrees, nobody disagrees. But when you want to sell on credit at a price higher than the cash price, for example, the house is on sale for a hundred thousand ringgits. He's a dreamer. Where can you buy a house for 100,000 ringgit? <laughs> huh? Let's be more realistic. House is on sale for a million ringgit. That's more reasonable. The house is on sale for a million ringgit. And you don't have the million. So the Islamic bank says, no problem, we will buy the house for one million ringgit and then we will send it to you for three million ringgits. 
So you and I are both aware that the profit margin, what they call the markup, I thought marking was something you did on the blackboard, <laughs> is two million ringgits, okay? The, 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 the first little fly in the ointment is that the bank never buys the house. The bank never owns the house. And it is an invalid transaction to sell that which you do not own. Okay? So they must correct this anomaly. You must first take full ownership of the property or the goods before you can sell it. It's so simple a matter, nobody should become boss in love with me. But the reason why they don't do that is because of the legal charges and taxes and so on. To save on that. Okay, so putting that aside, an invalid transaction because you're selling that which you do not own. The, the cash price of the house is one million. If I had the one million, I could buy it for cash for one million. So that's the cash price. That's the market price. Why should I pay three million for that which is on sale for one million? The answer, the only honest answer, is it because I am given time to pay. He has to wait for his money. So that's why I'm paying him three million. So time and money are married together. Money is increasing over time. It is river. But because it is disguised as a Murabaha transaction, I said this is backdoor river. <laughs> okay? But if you are not convinced by me, you don't have to accept my views. No. Just wait until the angel comes to take your soul. If you are not convinced, you don't have to accept my views. Because of these that I've just described, Al-Azhar University and that bogus fatwa, the bank interest is not river. Because of these that I've just described, a Murabaha transaction that is masquerading, it is actually backdoor river. And when I get a chance to speak to you on the second half of the subject of river, you see how that is just as dangerous as this one. What is that second part? If you meet a man coming to the market to sell his goods, a truckload of durian, and you buy his durians from him before he could enter in the market, and when he enters into the market, he finds that he could have gotten a better price in the market. Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam said that that is riba. You, let us use elegant language. You exploited his ignorance of the market price to extract from him a profit or a gain to which you were not justly entitled. It's elegant language, isn't it? <laughs> Americans don't use that. Americans say you ripped him off. <laughs> it's a rip off. That's river. That's river. The biggest rip off of all that has occurred. Since Adam alayhi salam set foot on earth, that's quite some time ago. Is this one? Oh, I know, have it with me. Have you ever seen it? You take a piece of paper and you print a picture and you put a number and you do not repeat what Imran was saying is saying now until you study international monetary economics. So you must know your subject. So anyone who stands up to you will get a fitting reply. You take a piece of paper, you print a picture, you put a number, you say abracadabra. <laughs> And you assign to the piece of paper an entirely 
fictitious family. So you make wealth out of nothing. If you can do that, my gosh, you could buy all the oil of Saudi Arabia. All that you need is some machines, some paper and some ink. And you need a couple hundred thousand jackasses out there. Excuse the language. And you could buy all the oil in Saudi Arabia. And that's what they did. That's what they did. That is the international monetary system that exists today. Don't bother to go back to 1944 and Bretton Woods when they were throwing dust in your eyes. And you didn't see it because you were always drinking Titanic. And there's too much traffic to study the Quran. If you had done that, you would have seen that this paper currency is bogus, is fraudulent, is haram. Hmm? When I said this 15 years ago, they were laughing at me. And when I said that the US dollar has to collapse, it's bound to collapse. And when it collapses, it will bring down all the paper money with it. They thought that I belong to this Disneyland. <laughs> That's right. That's the kind of response I got 15 years ago. I heard your former Prime Minister say, money has no intrinsic value. That's what Dr. Mahathir said. Those days, of course, he had eyes and he couldn't see. But I gather that later on he began to see. And then he called for the cold denial. But for 15 years now we have been saying that this is bogus, this is fraudulent, this is haram. The only thing we did not do is to cry that the tears would come out of our hearts. But we couldn't wake them up. No, we couldn't wake them up. So how are we going to get out of the situation in which we are? When the Jal has attacked us with his deadliest weapon and has achieved success after success until he is now on the verge of imposing universal political, economic and financial slavery upon mankind. And yet the Ummah of Muhammad is busy drinking Tehari. It's a pitiable thing. But I have hope in the young ones. There is a tomorrow which is coming. When this Quran is going to dazzle the world. There is a tomorrow which is coming. When this Quran is going to shake the world. Allah says, Sanurihi ayatina fil afa. وفي أنفسهم حتى حتى يتبين لهم أنه الحق. As the ayat of Allah unfold, the ayat of Allah will demonstrate conclusively the truth of His word. Where are those here? Those scholars? Where are those? gifted, blessed scholars who are to come tomorrow. Maybe one of them is sitting in this gallery. They're going to be chosen. We will be in our graves. But they are going to take the banner of Islam. They're going to take the Quran and take he who taught the Quran and dazzle the world by using the Quran as we have done tonight in a humble way. And using the ahadith of the Prophet to explain the reality of the world in which we now live. I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may bless one from amongst you, inshaAllah. Rabbana taqabbal minna inna ka anta samir alim wa tubalina ya mulana inna ka anta tawabur alim. 
Terima kasih.